have your Bibles this morning, open them in the 8th chapter of the book of Proverbs. 8th chapter of the book of Proverbs. Again, we'd like to recognize all these visitors that are with us. May the Lord bless you, brother. Alan Jones and his wife Shirley is here from up in Ohio, pastor friend of ours, dear friends, we thank God for them. Amen. We have our annual camp meeting. We always see Acre Baptist Church been having it for nearly ten years now. We'll have it start next Sunday. Brother Leroy Dow Ripple will be here with us and uh, Brother Earl Hughes and Brother Ed Brother Blue, Brother Stinnett Blue. And a great number of men from all over America will be here. We have a big camp meeting. Look forward to it. We're old-fashioned, non-charismatic Baptist people. I said non-charismatic. That's what we are. But once in a while in this church, somebody loves to holler amen. And if it gets to move a little bit better, they love to holler praise the Lord. And if anything happens, they love to jump up and shout and run out the door. Amen. That's right. And uh, we've uh, been... Just asking God to do whatever He wants to do. But in your Bibles this morning, the eighth chapter of the book of Proverbs. And I pray that you'll pray and ask God to speak to your heart. It says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the path. When wisdom is crying today, she cries at the gates at the entrance of the city, at the coming in at the doors. The wisdom is crying out. I've often wondered about this. Maybe you wonder about it. Every prison, nearly in the state of Texas, some of these men here are in these jails preaching, and everybody wants us in there. Yeah, the chaplains want us in there. The governor wants us in there. They won't roll off out of the state. And they want us in the prison. That's really strange to me. And uh, these boys, they go down to the public school and hand out tracts on the sidewalk, not on the school. And they don't want anybody giving a child in Houston a tract, a gospel tract, or a Bible. But after he gets in jail, they want you to come down there and try to give him a Bible and counsel with him and pray with him. And after his mind is just rain from drugs and liquor, and what have you, they want you to pray with him. And, and uh, you know, it's no, no uh, confrontation with church and state. You can go down there and pray with him, do anything you want to, as long as he's in prison. As long as he's not in school, not as long as he's trying to be educated to get ready to go to prison, but uh, while he's there. Amen? All right. But the Bible said she's crying at the gate of the entrance of the city, wisdom. At the coming of the door unto you, O men, I call. My voice is to the sons of men. Wisdom is saying this. O you simple, understand wisdom, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Now, my mother is a member of this church, and my father, and they've always told me, don't call anybody a fool. Mama used to really whoop us, and a couple of my sisters are here and members of this church, and uh, Mama never would allow us to use that word. But God is very liberal with that word, very liberal with that word. God says the man who says there's no God, God said he's a fool. And God said that. And about 150, 200 times, I looked the word at one time, about 150 or 200 times, God called man a fool. A fool. He said a man who committed fornication with a woman was a fool. God said he's a fool, and God said his neighbor would never forgive him, and his name would be blinded. Amen. Man said it's fun. Man said everybody's doing it. God said he's a fool. That's what God said. God said he's a fool. And I didn't say that. Because I don't want Mama to be getting on me after service is over. Amen. I'm not said that. But the Bible said, Hear, for I will speak of excellent things. And I want to preach this morning on things. I've been preaching 30 odd years, and people said, Now, you're not supposed to preach about things, but maybe these things will be a little different. And the opening of my lips shall be right things. From my mouth shall I speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing forward or perverse in them. They're plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. 
receive my instructions, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. Now, the average American thinks that silver and gold can solve all of his problems. And the more he gets, the more problems he has. Miss Rose Kennedy stood one day at afflicted child and said, uh, Joe, all the money that we've got, and we cannot solve this problem of this afflicted child. You won't live long until you'll find out that gold and silver does not solve your problems. He said, well, you can't go very far without it. I don't know. I lived in Cottage Grove, right off Washington Avenue, and nobody had anything. Back in the early 30s and what have you, and people enjoyed life, and, and now everybody lives out there has got bars on the windows. They tell me we're more educated and smarter than we was back then. Mama never even locked the door. Now, she's here to testify this morning. We never had a lock on the door. You could go in and out any time of the night, if you please. The dog even walked in and out. He didn't even bark at anybody. We didn't even have to have a bad dog. Now people have got Doberman pistols. Bars on the window. Pistols in the head. Scared to death. And don't we have a wonderful, educated society? Amen. Amen. God said, receive my instructions and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things, that's what I want to preach about, things that may be desired or not to be compared to it. He said, things are never to be compared to the wisdom of God. And what kind of thing should we, as God's people, be looking for? Well, the Bible speaks here in verse, uh, the first verse of verse 6, it said here, And I will speak of excellent things. And I believe God's children ought to be looking for the best. I believe they ought to be looking for the things that are, are excellent. And the Bible said there in Proverbs 22, 20, Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsel? And knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. God said, I've written you a Bible. I've left you a book that you might know excellent things. And through these excellent things that you might know knowledge and you might have the words of truth. Johnny Terry said, what is truth? I'll tell you what truth is. Truth is turn from your sin to a Savior. Turn from the hawk and talks. To God Almighty and be saved by the grace of God. That's the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I'm the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I want to speak today on excellent things. This Bible says that you may prove those signs that are excellent. You can think of thank proof. Is it excellent? Is it wonderful? Men can stand up here that's been saved. There's men on these front rows, been never prison, ever penitentiary, been in everything in the world. They've been from ever prison to ever a college and institution. You could ask them, and they'd say, you better seek wisdom. You go to Brother Brad Cole, and he knows nothing about a jail. He was raised in a college professor's home and became a college professor himself. He wouldn't know nothing about that, but you could ask him the question, Brother Brad, uh, do you find... Uh, a truth in all those books and all that science. And he'll tell you, like his dad will tell you today, there's no truth in it. They say, I think that about a million years ago, man come from a monkey. I can prove that false in two seconds. They said when a baboon's wife dies, he never marries again. That leaves him unkin to man. Amen. They don't take no fool to figure that out. No fool figure that out. Amen? Amen. He don't even wait she died. He watch what she lives at home and talks around. Amen? Amen. All right. You said I don't like you. I'm just telling the truth. I thought you said tell it like it is. That's what we're fixing to do. He said, I speak of you of excellent things. I'm talking about the excellent things. What is excellent things, Brother Wood? We find there in Philippians 1.10 that you may prove those signs that are excellent. It's excellent to serve God. And there's been nobody that served God, was saved by the grace of God, 
and he served God and got up and said, I never heard the testimony in 30 odd years of preaching and said, I'm sorry that I ever served him. I wish that I never served him. But how many times have I been in the home? And they said, Brother Wood, back down the years ago, we served God and lived for God. And we got away from God and got out of church and got our family out of church. And Brother Wood, we've had a heartache, just a heartache. I'm saying again, it's excellent. It's an excellent thing to serve God. My brother-in-law sitting right in front of me, Brother Brownie Rogers, and I remember him and I drove a truck together back in the early 40s, and, and uh, he was saved and living for God. You can ask him today, how long you been saved? And he tell you nearly 45 years. You say, well, Brother, Brother Rogers, is it excellent to serve the Lord? And he said, yes. And my mother's been saved about 65 years. And that's a while. 65 years. And I asked her the other day, I said, how is it mama serving the Lord? She said, wonderful. Wonderful. I, I'm trying to say that it's excellent. I asked Miss Sides the other day, 77 years old, been saved 50 some odd years. I said, Miss Sides, how is it to serve the Lord? Wonderful, Brother John. Wonderful. I'm just trying to tell you it's excellent to serve God. It's excellent to serve God. Then the Bible says in Proverbs 17, you have your Bible? Let's look a minute just in the Bible. Let's, let's do a little Bible or research. Look in verse 7 of the 17th chapter. Verse 7, it said, Excellent speech, but cometh not a fool. Much less do lying lips to a prince. Excellent speech, but cometh not a fool. The Bible says you can have the excellent way, will give you excellent service for God. It will give you excellent speech. When God saves a person, He changes their speech. You said, Brother Wood, I, I, I just used that bad word that slipped out. The reason it slipped out, it was in your dirty black heart. Amen? That's the reason it slipped out. You hit your finger, and what was in your heart came out. Amen? Yeah, I've seen people hit their finger and say, Praise God! You know what's in his heart? Praise God! Man, I've heard him say something else, too. The reason he said that? He never met that excellent speech. Amen? Excellent speech. That same chapter there in verse 17. Look at it. Chapter 17. Look at it. Look at your Bible a minute. In verse 27. He that hath not inspired his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. A person who's found excellent times. He has excellent service. He has excellent speech. And God will give him an excellent spirit. You go into church, you find some people that have old style, ugly attitudes. And you get through talking to them, you want to go take a shower. You've met people like that. If you haven't, hang around Shade Acre, there's some here. And, I, and, I, I mean, and every time you see them, you say, you know what they said? You know what they said? They're running around. They're whispers, backbiters, haters of God. Amen. Haters of God's people trying to destroy and tire down. God said when they, you find the excellent way, he said, I'll give you an excellent spirit. Thank God for people. Isn't it wonderful to meet people and you say, boy, I'll tell you, that just made my day. Hey, have you ever met a boy like that? He said, my, wasn't it wonderful? I, I met a Mormon missionary the other day, and I said, that young man, you say anything you want to him about, but he just had a good attitude about it. And he and I talked a good while, and he said, can I come back by your house? And I said, yes, sir, I'll come right back by. And I gave him a testimony, told him how I was saved, told him where I was a pastor, and I, and I just, I said, sir, you made my day. He said, well, he was, no, he was just a nice guy. Sometimes, you know, you stop by and visit some Baptist member of your church and, and you say, how you feel? And you wish you hadn't asked him. Amen. All right. All right. But it's excellent things. And then notice in verse 7 there, for my mouth shall speak truth. There's truthful things. And wickedness is abomination to my lips. In his hand it's wicked. In his hand it's ungodly. In his hand it's unclean. He said it's an abomination to my lips. In other words, I'm looking for the truthful way. Ephesians 4.15 said, But speaking the truth in love, you may grow up unto him in all things. In all things. And God is speaking here of you and I in truthful things. I'm talking about something that has reality to it. Something that is, is genuine, if you please. Something that's real. Something that's ideal. Brother Bushcock, you remember... When you got saved, 
Which told me, said, I, I believe all religion's good. I said, all I've ever seen is bad. But he was kind of stunned. He said, you don't think all religion's good? I said, it's all bad. He said, I'm a Methodist. I said, it's bad. Huh? I said, I was a Baptist. I, I said, the rottenest thing under God's heaven is religion. Baptist religion, Methodist religion, whatever it is. Anybody just put it all in one pot and it up. I mean, it's not worth a dime. Pure, pure religion. And undefiled before God is this. That a man would visit the fathers and the widows and keep himself unspotted from the world. I mean, what is pure religion? What is pure religion? Pure religion. The rest of it, all the rest of it, is wicked as a snake. It's all in give me, give me, give me. How many men here this morning, you're going to be a missionary, stand up. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up. Where are you going, son? Going to John. When are you leaving? In two weeks. Thank you. Sit down. Brother Bryce? Going this year, right? Going this year. Amen, brother. Going to China. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Miss one. Excuse me, brother. Going to Spain. What do you all do around this church, brother Woods? Get them and send them out. Get them and send them out. These men are... Some graduate in Bible colleges and Bible schools. These men are ready to go. They're ready to go. Praise God. That's an excellent thing. That's truthfulness. Amen? Amen. You, one man said to me years ago, he said, oh, you're sending everybody out. You had about 50 people. Do you remember? He said, everybody's going out. He said, how are we going to get a church when everybody's going out? More goes out, more comes in. But Jones, he looked at me the other day, and he had been a year since he was here, and he said, man, there's a lot of new faces around here. Yes, sir. You keep sending them out, and they're just God will send them in. God will save them from. Amen. Hallelujah. Excellent. Excellent thing. And then truthful thing. God is truthful in His promises. I'm glad for this. I'm glad God, God keeps His promises. I'm glad for that. Truthfulness. Truthful. And look at it. The truthful things. Verse 7. My mouth. Just speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination. I'm not going to listen to no dirty joke. I'm not going to tell no dirty joke. I'm not going to hear no. I'm just not going to talk about nothing that's not clean and righteous and wholesome and godly. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about truthful things. God's promises are truthful. And I want to say this this morning. I said something in Sunday school. kind of bothers me both. But God's judgment is truthful. God's judgment is truthful. But we live in a time when people don't want to hear about hell, but there is a hell. People don't want to hear about heaven, but there is a heaven. Amen? And the wages of sin is still death, and the gift of God is still eternal life, and that's just the way it is. And God's judgments are truthful. Amen? And God's word is truthful. And God's riches is truthful. Man said, to, well, you just get with God, and you'll starve to death. That's a lie. I could, I, could have, I could have 50 men stand up right now. now Joe, you, uh, George Chance, do you remember when you got saved? Lord, have mercy. We ain't going to talk about it. We ain't going to talk about it when you got saved. Amen? We ain't going to... You, you remember that when you got saved? We ain't going to talk about it. We ain't going to talk about it. I mean, man, God, God. Jerry Luther, the first time I ever saw you, my soul. Sitting on a motorcycle, never had a quarter. Didn't know where you was at or where you was going. Still don't know much, but you know more than that. Amen? It's wonderful, wonderful Dad, to be saved by the grace of God. And God in His mercy. Yes, sir. Truthful. God's truthful in His riches. God takes a dirty life and makes it a clean life. God takes a troubled mind and puts that mind to trust in Him and gives it perfect peace. That's truthful things. Truthful things. Let me go on. I want to speak in verse 8 just a moment. All the words in my mouth are in righteousness. I'm going to talk about some righteous things now. I want to talk about righteous things. Chapter 10, you got your Bible, look at that in verse 2. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteous delivered from death. The world doesn't believe that. You sit here today, you're not saved, you didn't believe that. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Man said, if I could steal enough, I'd be all right. But man's never stole enough to make him all right. This Bible says again and again and again, look at it please, the treasures of wickedness profit nothing. The treasures of wickedness. Man bragged about his exploits. 
Man might go to the job, he brags about his fornication, his drunkenness, his living against God, and all of a sudden God's judgment comes, and the, the treasures of wickedness probably nothing. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. We'll get out here in a minute where you live. It'll deliver you from death. That's righteous things. Chapter 11 and verse 5. The Bible said the righteous, the righteousness of the perfect shall direct his ways. It said righteousness will direct your ways. God said if you're saved and you live right and you do right, righteousness shall direct your ways. I don't care what you're fixing to do this morning. I don't care what kind of decision you've got to make. Just make it under the light of righteousness. Would God have me to do this? Would it benefit the Lord's work? Would it benefit me as God's child? Would it make me a better Christian? I'll make a decision. And that light, and that light only. Amen, amen, amen. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Righteous signs. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. The world doesn't believe that. That's the reason when he opens his Venetian blind and he sees two Christians from Shade Acre Baptist Church knocking on his door, he turns off the television and gets real quiet. Nobody home. And then when he walks in, you said, I say what I hate worse than anything is a hypocrite. That ain't real good. Smile. Come on, smile now. Come on. Come on. But that's not being ugly. I was born this way. My mother said I was. Amen. In the house of God, we're looking for entertainment. There's one thing we don't want. In the pulpit, we don't want a man of God to stand up and say what God said. We said, tell it like it is, until he tells it like it is. We said, preach the Bible, until he said, preach the Bible. Yes, sir. I had a professor in school, and he went to a big, large Baptist church. He got there, and he taught, he's a real Bible teacher, and he taught through the book of Corinthians. And he got out after that verse where it said, and uh, all liars and homemongers and drunkards and effeminate and what have you shall not have a part uh, in the kingdom of God. And a lady got up and said, now, we have a wonderful Bible teacher here, and you've messed the whole thing up this morning. That's where people are. Amen. How to mess it up, preacher? Just preaching the Bible. But in the house of God, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for entertainment. We're looking for social life. We're looking for fun and food and foolishness. We're looking for a well, or maybe even a wife, or maybe even something to work to do. But I'll tell you what God's looking for. God's looking for somebody with an excellent spirit, somebody with a righteous attitude, they want to live for God. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. The, the, right, the righteous, 1021 said, the desires of the righteous shall be granted. The Bible said the righteousness is an everlasting foundation. Thank God for the righteous saints of God that founded our nation. Amen. Amen. Now look in verse 9, please. They all are plain to find him that is understanding. They are all plain to him that understandeth. And right to him to find out. Look at that word plain things. Plain things. Do you love plain things? I believe a Christian ought to be some things we're looking for. There ought to be excellent things. There ought to be truthful things. There ought to be righteous things. There ought to be plain things. We ought to have a plain preacher. We ought to be plain people. I ain't talking about plain stupid. I'm talking about plain people. Amen? We ought to be plain people. Let me tell you something about God. Nothing strange about God. Nothing spooky about God. You know, some people floating around, you know, like got new ring in their eye. He said, if you heard anything from the Lord, knowing you haven't either. Here's a Bible right here. got a Bible right here. Amen. One lady came to me one day and she said, I, I said, I was coming down that street, Brother Wood, you won't believe it. She used to be a member of the old church years ago. And she said, a, a car, just sideswiped my car. And so I just prayed. And she said, I, and she said, there's not even a scratch on that car. No crazy Willie calls me and said, you better go out there and look, lady. That thing, that whole side knocked off of it. She was so spooky and so strange and so charismatic, she didn't know she had a wreck. And when you get so stupid you don't know you had a wreck, you eat up with it. I mean, if another car can hit you and you don't know it, I mean, something will matter with you. And that's right. Listen, we need plain preaching. Amen. Nothing strange about it. Nothing off the wall. Jesus was a simple man. I said, Jesus was a simple man. He lived a simple life. He ate simple food. He wore simple clothes. He died a simple death. Listen, Jesus Christ was a simple man. Get up and get up off the wall with some stuff. Get some words nobody in the world can understand. Have to have three dictionaries. Understand what preachers say. 
Amen. Jesus was a simple man. The Bible is a simple book. You say, I don't believe that, brother. Well, I've read it. I don't understand the thing in the world about it. Isn't that strange? My mother went to the eighth grade. My daddy went to the third. And both of them read the Bible and preached it and lived it for all these years. Just ask me anything you want to know. And you went to college. Your problem is not what you can't understand. Your problem is what you can't believe. This is a book of faith. It's a simple book. You say, Brother Wood, I don't believe that. It's simple. The Bible said, In hell he lifted up his eyes. What does that mean, Brother Wood? That means in hell he lifted up his eyes. In my father's house in many houses. What does that mean? It's simple. It means in his father's house in many houses. Many mansions. One guy said, Well, my version, it says many rooms. I know it, but you have raised in the ghetto. The Bible said, In my father's house are many mansions. Amen. Jesus was a simple man. The Bible is a very simple book. You can believe it. Salvation is very simple. Jesus put a child on his leg and sat on his leg and said, Come as a little child, or you shall not enter the kingdom. Why? Salvation is simple. All you've got to do is ask God to save you. Turn from your sin, and he'll do it. Very simple. Very simple. Salvation is simple. The Christian life is simple. What's simple about it, Brother Wood? Look for the excellent thing, turn from the ungodly thing, turn from the unrighteous thing, and turn to that which is good and pure and right. It's very simple. Very simple. I've met people who couldn't read a word, they could live for God. I've met people who were completely uneducated that live for the Lord. And I've met men with PhD degrees that didn't even where they was at. More or less where God was at. Amen. For well, isn't the Lord wonderful? Well, I thought, now I'd like to speak a little bit about the right things in verse 9. And it's right to them that find knowledge. There's right things. The Bible said, he that wins his souls is wise. So it's wise to go tell people about Jesus. It's wise to stand on the street corner and preach. It's wise to pass out Christ. It's wise to tell people how to get saved. That's wise. The Bible, I mean, and it's right. In chapter 20 and verse 11, I got to, I got to, I got to reading over in 20 and 11. And a lady told me the other day, she said, my child is just hyperactive. I said, my mother used to have a cure for that. She said, what was it? I said, she had a, she had a, they had a lady living next door, her name was Miss McCaskill, and she had a big plum tree. And mama cut one in plum limbs off, and you wouldn't be hyperactive anymore. I'm telling you, it was the best sedative I ever saw. She gave it to me two or three times, and, and she didn't have to give it to me anymore. I mean, it had a lasting effect on it. Now these children just interrupt all the conversation, and they say, he's right. That's wrong. That's wrong. I said, well, look for some right things. I know Dr. Spock and, and Dr. Spoodle Doodle and all that. I know all that. But I, I'm telling you, we raised a generation of idiots. Yeah. Amen, Brother Wood. I didn't say everybody. I said a generation full. But there's enough to go around to everybody. I mean, we moved over here, had moved over here two weeks, and a bunch of kids got a gun and just took them a baseball bat and knocked the, knocked the doors out of the church and what have you. Listen. I was raised and tried to grow the roughest in the town that there was, and there wasn't a child, not a child, who would dare even go near that church. We weren't only scared of the church, we were scared of the preacher. And he's a kind, gracious old man. We were scared to death. We go down to Christmas, they'd give us a bag of fruit and this, that, and the other. Wasn't nobody going to sneak that church and steal nothing. I was a grown man before I ever heard of anybody. But, but we've raised us a generation disrespect God, disrespect the church. Amen. Amen, brother. Wood. Amen. There's some right things. There's some right things. Wise things. Flee evil. God said a wise man and flee evil. Amen. I mean, he just runs from it. He's scared to death of it. Amen. But he's laughed at in this day and time. He's not even a man anymore if he wants to live pure and godly and holy. I mean, somebody thinks he's a sissy. Now, you walk down here and serve a slap when his big old boy sitting on front row and find out if he's a sister. Amen. Try one of them. They didn't get all them scars on the head in Sunday school. You get that? They men. They one of them men. They one of them men. Amen. They ain't a damn be time they ate a fruitcake in this church. Amen. That's right. That's right. Every queer coming out running off my self personally. Amen. What, what I, why I can't handle I get Rick Warren to help me. Amen. That's right. I'll be right, thanks. Amen. 
I don't even like I like everybody to walk right. Amen? If your man ought to walk like a man, I believe that. It's right. It's right. It's right. You ought to dress like a man. You ought to put your clothes on like a man. You ought to wear your hair like a man. That's God ought to be a man. You ought to get your dress and wear it. You say, I ain't never coming back. I'm glad you got here one. Amen. God bless your heart. I'm glad you're here. Wise things to win souls. Worthy things are not right. Wicked things, there's some better things. The better things are to be compared to wisdom. Wisdom is to know how to use the knowledge that God gives you. How to be a wise man, and a Christian man, a godly man, raise godly children, build a Christian home. That's wise. And God said you need to compare it. He said this wisdom is better than rubies. Better, you better have it than every gem and every jewel you could put in a box. God said you need it. What is it, preacher? Let's look at it a minute. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and verse 15, the things of this world pass away. Why does the Christian want to have things that's going to pass away? And there's things in this life that's going to pass away. I was listening to a, listening to a football game yesterday on the broadcast coming in from out in the country, me and one of the boys, and we turned it on and they was interviewing some guy. And they said, you used to be one of the great running backs. And and he said, yeah, that's right. Then he interviewed some other guy, and he used to be something. And he said, yeah, for seven years. But isn't it wonderful? When you come to a grave, you have to bury some old saint of God. You get up and say, it's wonderful. Then for 50, 60, 70 years, they live for God. We called a man the other day. He's a Southern Baptist preacher and a friend of all the men in, over in the East. And his name is John Akers. We call John Akers as 100 and 14 years old. You say, I don't believe that. I don't care what you believe in that. It doesn't make a bit of difference. He buried his son the other day. And John said, that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And they said, John, why? Well, he said, I've been with him 92 years ago when he was born. His son was 92 years old, Brother Banner. Old Brother John Akers has preached all over this country. And somebody asked him the other day, he said, when are you going to retire? He said, well, i got the whole next year booked, so I can't retire now. One of the men asked him the other day on his 114th birthday, I was standing right there. They called him on the telephone and said, John, do you have any regrets for serving God? He said, I've preached ever since that boy, before he was born. And that boy was 92 years old. He's been preaching 90 something years. And he said, I just want to, he said, I ain't got a thing. So I moved out of my little shack, moved down here to rest home, and got me a driver. And he said, I got me a driver, and they drive me to me. His mind just clears the bell, his speech just clears the bell. I'm telling you, it pays to serve God. It pays to serve God. Amen. I got to think about this thing this morning. The things of the world pass away. I got to read. I know you're going to get mad. Don't, don't get mad at me. I, I was reading the other day, and I, I, I was like you. Way back in 1951, there was a man died, and he, right before he died, he, he had a girl in a family way, and he went down to Birmingham, out I mean, Montgomery, Alabama, and he got a, he got a certificate and put his name down on there. So this is my daughter, and he signed his name Hank Williams, and he, and he put it in there. And so for 27 years, this girl has never knew who she was. Just the other day, and just the other day, she finally got a birth certificate, looked out there, and it said Hank Williams. Is your dad. And then she got a picture for her and Hank Williams' mother, Miss Stone, and where that they had, uh, where she had, was holding her in her arms when she was two years old, and she'd raised her, she was two, and they'd give her to a foster parent and another foster parent, and she went everywhere. But when she came 29 years old, she found out that she was a legal heir to everything that Hank Williams ever had. Hank Williams died with an overshot of dope in the back seat of a car over down in Kentucky on, the, on New Year's night, and the world, they said he's a legend. But I'm going to tell you today, he's not a legend, he's a loser. You said you shouldn't be irreverent to the dead, I'm not being irreverent to the dead, I'm being irreverent to those that said it. The man's not a legend, he's a loser. He left the boy, four years old, and that boy become one of the worst drug addicts off the money he had, and trying to sing, I stood in my daddy's shadows. I'm going to tell you one thing, if you don't get in the shadows of the Lord Jesus, he'll die and go to hell. Are you listening to me this morning? This young lady, this young lady, I began to listen. I began to read this thing. As I got through reading in the dentist's office this week, I looked at that thing and I said, my soul, this boy took all the wealth, he took his daddy's name, he took his daddy's fame, and he's done exactly what his daddy's done. He's going to die without God, just like his daddy did. What a horrible thought. This young lady, I saw her, beautiful young lady. I saw her stand there and the picture of her. 
And she said, I'm going to write a book the first thing. And she said, my inheritance just comes into the hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. And I'm going back and making payments from 1953 to the day my daddy died up until now. And I've got millions and millions coming. And then after I get all of that to what I want to do, I want to sing from one honky tonk to the next. Mm-hmm. He said, Brother Wood, what is it? There's better things. God said, compare them. Hank stood up and said, I saw, him, I saw the light. But I'm going to tell you one thing Hank ever saw was the night. One of the best friends I've got today, Brother Larry Richardson, a three-time world champion banjo picker, told me, said, I played with him, Jack. He said, I talked to him just a few days before he died. And he said, Hank, stand there, couldn't even get up on the platform. And he said, he said it's so dark. And he said, that, that many pearls turned around and said, Hank, said, have you ever been saved? And said, that old woman that somehow another knows the Lord and begin to witness to him. And he said, I ain't never saw the light. I'm lost and I wish I could see the light. I wish I could see the light. But he died in the night. Yeah. Well, I said, he's a legend. His daughter said, I want to live just like him. But God said, there are some excellent things. God said, there are some righteous things. God said, there are some truthful things. I want to tell you, if you follow what this world does, you'll wind up just like they did. He said, you shouldn't speak that way about the dead. The dead shouldn't leave a little girl homeless. I didn't do it, Hank did it. What you told me about, I, I went around and we taking up that chain. Where are you taking up that chain for? For little orphan children. Little orphan children and men leave up and down these boulevards. What you think about? We built them all over this land. I mean, from here to Oklahoma, Brother Jones, you've seen them take up orphans, what have you, for these orphans home all up down this land. But man laughs and wipes his mouth and leaves a girl pregnant on the street, and the world calls him a legend. And a man gets up and raises money and rescues the little children and puts them in a home where they have a place, and the world calls him a fool. We'll meet God one day, sister and brother. We'll meet God one day, and we'll find out who was a fool. We'll find out who was a fool. We'll find out a whole lot before that. You just keep going. We'll find out a whole lot time before that. Amen? Amen. Said he was a legend. They said he was famous. God said, you listen to me today. I'm not being irreverent. I'm not saying nothing about the dead. But we just had a big deal here the first day of the year. And the world said he's famous. And God said he's a fool. God said that. He didn't say it. God said he's a fornication with a woman's a fool. God said, man, live this world. He said, lay down, said, I have need of nothing. God said, he's a fool. He said, he'll meet God in the morning. And in the morning, he met God. By his own testimony, unprepared. What if you had to meet God in the morning? He said, what are you going to do, Brother Wood? i tell you. Many years ago, there was a movie star. I said, made a couple remarks about her. I could call her name. Elizabeth Taylor. Went into a bookstore and a little Baptist bookstore downtown. There was an old saint of God lived there, Miss Show Walters. And Miss Show Walters, remember the first Baptist church over there, Miss Show Walters said to me, she said, for 20 years, preacher, she said, me and that girl, since she was a young girl, has had a correspondence. And she said, I write her, and she writes me. And said, I send her literature and gospel literature, and I'm praying that God would save her soul. She said, she's a wicked woman, a godless woman. But she said, I'm praying that God would save her soul. You know what a Christian does? A Christian looks at reality, and yet he loves that sinner. He sees that little girl in the honky tonks and the slot shoots of this world, and the man of God says, God help her, and prays for her. Amen? He's not ugly about it, but he warns young people sitting in the service just like this. You want to be just like them. You want to dress like them. You want to wear your hair like them. You want to look like them. You want to be just like them. They're the most miserable people under all of God's earth. Hank Williams, about before he died, carried a man out fishing. I sat down and read his whole life. Took a man out fishing. He said, you know, I'm 26 years, 27 years old. He said, I guess I'm the most miserable man on all earth. And he said, he'd take a drink. He said, I just didn't. He'd take a pill. And he'd take another drink. He said, you know, I've made a fortune. I, I've become one of the most famous men. But he said, I'm the most miserable man. That man said, he said, I'd and fish with him. A lost man, just like he was. So he said, turn fish. And he said, I fished with the most miserable man that ever lived. The things of this world cannot satisfy you. When Elvis Presley got ready to die, and death started knocking on his door, he had a book about Jesus in his hand. He'd already called a man who 
when his faith healers and called him and asked him if he could help him, he done been to his house and prayed with him and told him nothing in the world that could help him. But he went there and prayed with him. And I thought to myself, even this young man with millions of dollars in a rock and roll spa, when he come time to die, he died with a book in his hand. When the Paul Bear got to the house, there was a book in his hand about the life of Christ. You know what he's looking for? He found out millions couldn't do it, and fame couldn't do it. He's looking for the answer. He's looking for the real thing. I hope somewhere in the darkness of the night he found it. I hope he did. I hope he did. I doubt he did, but I hope he did. I don't hope nobody off into hell. There's a hell waiting for those who miss God. There's right things. There's excellent things. There's righteous things. And you better do the right thing. Let's pray. Let's pray this morning. You might be here by divine providence. God might have sent you by. You've heard the truth this morning. There are excellent things. Oh, what wonderful it is for a young man or young woman to get saved as young people. These young men have stood up and said where they was going. You ought to hear their back testimony. None of them was raised up in a church. None of them grew up in church. These men got saved from different parts of life, different walks of life. God has called them. God has called them. But first, God saved them and put their families together and their homes together and their minds together and their education together, their Bible knowledge together. As they began to get it all together, God began to call them and send them. I say, you young man, young lady, turn your life over to the Lord while you're young. Remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Remember the good things. The good things. Our Heavenly Father, we preach what was on our heart this morning. Pray you'd speak to that one that needs help. That one that needs a Savior today. Lord, I pray you'd speak to them. They might pick the good thing. Chosen a good thing. God help them today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Eighty-one. Let's pray just a moment. I want to pray. There's people in the altar. You know, there might be somebody here today. You're lost, and you've never been saved. You said, Preacher, all my life I've looked for those excellent things. Brother Brad and I, we spent a lot of time together on the highway. And like I say, he was raised up around a college. His daddy was a college professor. He sought out education, what have you, but he said he always had an empty life, had an empty heart. But one day in San Diego, California, down in San Diego, walked up to a little blonde-headed girl passing out sandwiches, and, and there Lynn was, and began to witness to him, give him a Bible. Not long after that, God saved him. God saved him, and then all that which looked like success and, and everything and the scholarship of the world and all that grew strangely dim. She left the college and entered the Bible Institute to train for the work of God. I'm not saying everybody does it that way, but I'm saying this. There are some excellent things. There are some plain things. Just as plain as the nose on your face. Just plain. Things that don't work and things that do work. And it's right to live for God. It's wrong not to. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you need to be saved. You say, Preacher, I need somebody to pray with me. You say, I'm just visiting here in town, Preacher. But I still, listen, you couldn't join this church this morning if you wanted to. Nobody's giving you an invitation to join this church. We're giving you an invitation to come to Jesus. We're giving you an invitation to get saved by the grace of God. Why don't you just come and say, Lord, here I am. I'd sure like to be saved today. Won't we all just pray? Brother Bobby, won't you just sing a moment? My, my sister and brother law down here in the front praying. Many, many years ago, this service is over with. We're not going to give any more invitation. Many, many years ago, I had a nephew that was hurt real bad. It was Lala's boy. And he was uh, in a bad wreck. He got injured at home. It was a real freak accident. He didn't know it. Big old stout, 220-pound boy. He, he went on uh, 
He went on out and that night to go somewhere and he was injured inside. He didn't know he was bleeding to death. Didn't even know it. And in a few minutes, well, he had a wreck. And the wreck really saved his life. Had concussion of the brain. And he never woke up and they couldn't figure out why he was bleeding on the inside. And the car had fell on him at home. He was working on an old car and he said, put a muffler on something. My brother-in-law didn't believe nothing. I was husband unsaved. And uh, Brother Brown, he was home praying, and he came to the hospital. He'd been unconscious about five or six weeks. And the doctor's coming that morning, and he called Lala and then called Charlie and said, I just called you in here to tell you the boy's going to die. So he said, he'll be dead in the next few days. And he uh, said, nothing else we can do. And Brother Brown kept praying, and uh, he was coming to work, and he stopped by the hospital. He said, I, Charlie said, we got some bad news. But that's what I, I come by here tell you some good news. And he said, what's that? He said, God told me he's going to let that boy live just to show you he's God. Well, he said, but you don't understand. He said, we just had a brain specialist in here. And he said, he can't live. He said, he's injured. He'll never walk. He can't do nothing. Four mornings later. And laying there about six, seven weeks, and my eyes opened, he looked around. Didn't know nobody, but he was looking around. And I looked at that big rascal about three nights ago, weighing 240 pounds, six foot two. And I said, God's real. Yeah. I looked at his daddy. I said to myself, God showed you he's God. He showed you that he's God. He said, I don't believe that. That makes way believe not. There's 15 people sitting here today and raised their hand and said, We're there, we witness and we know what happened. God said, I just want you to know that there's a God. And you know, Brother Jones, Jesus is so wonderful. He just stepped over the banners of glory, come down on earth, walked around, and said, I just want y'all to know He's God. They said, we'll, we'll fix you, we'll kill you, we'll put you in that grave. And they didn't put him in there. Next morning he got up and he said, I just want to tell y'all, He's God. He's God. He's God. And they've lied about him for 2,000 years. They've lied. But one of these days, you're going to hear a little toot. You're going to hear a little horn blow. And God comes and I just want you to know that he is God. And great is the mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. You want you to know it. You want you to know it. And we'll tell you, there's some living testimonies here that he's God. He's God. That's him. Let's pray now. Let's pray. We're just so glad you came, so glad you're here, so glad what you heard. You said, well, I'm there. That's good. Maybe you go home and think about it. Maybe it's been a good long time you've been going to some soft soaping preacher. He's patted you on the back and told you how wonderful you are, and God and you both know you're sorry as the devil. And so now you go home and, and you think about it. Think about the truth a while. Quit believing a lie. None of us any good. Man's degenerated, man's wicked, man needs a savior. Brother Brian Rogers, you dismiss us in prayer, please.